Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. This is Dennis and today I'm with Aaron from GSMSG. Got through it. How are you doing today? <laughs> good, good. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Um, so since this is the first time on the podcast, if you wouldn't mind doing just a quick introduction yourself. Yeah, so my name is uh, Aaron Epstein. I guess really brief background is that uh, my background was in defense contracting. I'm focused on kind of counterterrorism intel and uh, went to uh, Georgetown for their school foreign service for grad school, got a graduate degree in intelligence, um, focused on the Middle East for a while, <clears throat> and then you know, as I, let's say my my experiences on the ground kind of changed and shaped my interests, so that I, I, I viewed uh, maybe a better way to go about our interventions in some of these regions through uh, kind of medical outreach into some of these communities to get them more on board with us. So I came back to the U.S., um, went to Georgetown then for med school, and then went into surgery and then into trauma surgery. Um, where I'll be moving actually down to Miami, where the Army Trauma Training Center is uh, next year. Um, started the Global Surgical and Global Surgical and Medical Support Group, or GSMSG for short, back in 2015. Uh, the group itself is about 2,000 folks now. They're mostly prior special operations or intel. Uh, again, mostly on the medical side of things. And our goal as an organization uh, has been really to focus on training partners rather than just straight providing services. Uh, if you look at a lot of humanitarian groups around the world, they do a lot of great work. Um, you know, they, they, they change healthcare outcomes for, you know, 40, 50 people at a clip. Um, but it didn't seem to do a lot in terms of, you know, region wide or population wide effects. And so when we started back in 2015, working in Iraq and Syria space, you know, with the communities that were facing ISIS, our goal right from the get-go is essentially used to use the uh, SF model of being a force multiplier and training our, our partner forces and partner medical personnel so that, you know, all of their capabilities are improved. Um, so started with that, <clears throat> um, trained several thousand Kurdish, Peshmerga, and Iraqi forces um, who were facing off with ISIS, and that expanded to nursing, physician, surgeon uh, care as well. Um, from there, it expanded uh, to other parts of the world, working in coordination with uh, Department of Defense, Department of State, you know, trying to assist and augment their efforts. So in South America, for example, working with Sock South, um, where there was training Honduran uh, SF or their counter-narcotics teams. Um, ironically enough, recently, Guyana and along their Venezuelan border. Um, and then in Africa, again, working with AFRICOM and some of the civil affairs teams there and training some of the uh, host nation forces and their medical medical services. And, you know, some people might ask, like, what, how, how does it make sense to work with some of the military and security forces in some of these parts of the world and still kind of label yourself as humanitarian? I mean, if you think about it, though, in a lot of these parts of the world, the, the first responder network is their military. I mean, in Sierra Leone, for example, tanker blows up. The people that are responding are the Sierra Leone armed forces. There isn't really a a medical core that responds to these disasters. So um, that's part of that. And then um, with other efforts in other parts of the world, with the uh, uh, evacuation out of Kabul, we assisted in getting about 600 folks uh, to the airfield and coordinated their efforts to get them out. Um, in Europe, we assisted in training, for example, the Swedish uh, JMAO equivalent teams. Um, back in 2019, and then with Ukraine, as you know, I'd say one of the more recent and ongoing efforts has been, you know, a couple days after the war started, our guys were on the ground. Uh, prior uh, SF-18 Deltas, uh, SEAL medics, prior DOD physician surgeons, um, and that that's been a presence ever since. And that expanded uh, essentially along two tracks that you know I can talk in more detail about. But it basically, there was a, a, a training effort that tracked along with the Ukraine Special Operations Forces. And then there was another effort along the physician-surgeon route where we started bringing in, you know, the, essentially it was the largest U.S. presence of prior D, DOD physicians and surgeons on ground in Ukraine since the war started. Um, and, you know, some of the bigger notable names in our teams were, you know, John Holcomb, everyone knows him, uh, uh, Steve Smith, 
uh, who was the, uh, or Dr. Steve Wolf, who was the uh, prior Army's director of uh, burn surgery. And I mean, you know, pretty much a, a who's who's of who? a prior army. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it it was a, it was a big, a big, big roster we brought up there. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll kind of let you get to the questions too, before I keep rambling. That's okay. Um, so, you know, been talking about like surgery, like the, I don't know, the doing side of things, right? You have the surgical aspect, you have uh, more of the, uh, the frontline type medic uh, role. Um, and you kind of already started going into it. What are some of your lessons learned that maybe you'll start on the surgical resuscitation side of things? What are some lessons learned uh, in Ukraine uh, when you're dealing with, you know, you're dealing with yeah, mass so, casualty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so I would say one of the things that, um, well, <clears throat> let me preface this with this too, that uh, we did we did put out a, me and the uh, you know the number of surgeons that had gone over, we did put out a paper a couple of months ago that was on kind of preliminary lessons learned. Um, and if you if you just Google literally just uh, putting medical boots on the ground, um, the article by the American College of Surgeons uh, should come up. But um, so that's a much more comprehensive list of all the lessons learned at, at, at the time. So again, at the time meant that was pretty much the height of through where Russia was still engaging in very you know, mobile and offensive actions and stuff. So uh, not the necessarily stalemate that we have reached since then. So anyway, in terms of, you know, lessons learned, <clears throat> some of the big ones were that just resources required are significantly greater than they were, you know, in GWAT. If you looked at, you know, injury patterns um, and injury events during GWAT, it was rel relatively small in terms of scale. You know, if you had an IED go off, a couple guys, you know, and again, this is not to minimize casualties in any way, shape, or form, but you had a relatively small number of guys who may have been killed and, uh, again, a relatively small number of folks that may have been injured. In comparison, if you look at things like artillery barrage fire or you look even, you know, heavier duty like the TOS-1, you know, thermobaric barrage fires, you're looking at every incident being a mass casualty incident where, you know, dozens or more are killed and more injured. Um, and so the resources required in any given incident um, you, you chew through your resources real fast. So I would say going forward, you know, planning, looking at uh, near peer or peer adversaries uh, for future U.S. combat, we need to heavily invest in resources for the medical teams. I mean, you can't be pulling off, you know, one or onesies or twosies in terms of items. And, you know, a medic's bag isn't going to be enough for even a single mass fire incident from an opposition. So lesson one is, resources you need the resources to do the job and and i'd say dod needs to really invest in that um <clears throat> the other is you know injury patterns um i would say are significantly greater in terms of just uh the weapons face so again looking at you know everything was always in comparison to what we learned in oef oif and other you know kind of counterinsurgency or you know uh, you know campaigns around the world where if you were taking fire from, uh, for example, an insurgent or terrorist, you know, let's say you had a gunshot wound, you had your penetrating wound, maybe you had uh, multi, uh, multiple penetrating wounds, but it was relatively, uh, you know, low instance of that, unless it was an IED, for example, and then you had, you know, poly system, poly trauma um, instances. But what we were seeing in Ukraine is that every guy was coming in with poly trauma to every system. I mean, it was, because if you think about these, the, the shrapnel effects from artillery barrages, you had penetrating wounds to almost every single organ. I mean, you know, every, like you, people are getting chest tubes, getting x laps. Uh, you had near amputations of, of limbs, and you know, God forbid, there was penetrating wounds to the brain. Um, you know, it, it's just massive trauma. And so, I think one of the things that we noted in one of our data sets was that uh, you know the injury severity score which is, you know, just a metric kind of used by a lot of hospital systems to just gauge severity of injuries, um, was that the severity of the injuries we were seeing uh, was just way higher than what was kind of being routinely seen in, you know, during the war on terror. So, um, and, and this then feeds back into resources required are going to be greater. So every patient is now just not going to be, all right, John Doe 1 gets a chest tube, John Doe 2 gets a chest tube, John Doe 3 gets an X-lap. It's every one of these guys is getting 
bilateral chest tubes, again, X laps, again, tourniquets on. We got to figure out, you know, wounds, uh, vascular injuries. Um, so much more severe injuries when it came to, uh, in, uh, you know, facing, uh, you know, weaponry by near peer adversaries. And again, even the weaponry itself is is like a, it is a different skill. Uh, we're working on a paper right now that actually looks at you know effects of thermobaric weapons um, from our team's encounters, whether it is the the toss one thermobaric artillery system or the thermobaric grenades or the RPO uh, thermobaric uh, rocket, you know the RPG essentially uh, thermobaric rocket. Um, and and again, the difference is when you are looking at uh, you know, counterinsurgency weaponry, you know, an IED by definition is, is an improvised device. It's something they just made. Um, whereas when you're looking at pure adversaries, you're looking at manufactured weapons on an industrial scale to industrial standards, you know. So diff- it's like it's like trying to, you know, build a Mauser in your garage versus picking up your M4, you know. One, one of these is a very effective weapon that can really – F you up pretty bad. And the other is something, hey, I threw it together and I hope it shoots in a straight line, you know? So, um, so that was, uh, I think some of the more, you know, uh, just kind of global, uh, lessons we learned in terms of, uh, just, I think there, I think it really comes back to the resources required are just going to be much greater in a, in future warfare. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, one, absolutely. Especially when you're talking about injury, it sounds, it sounds like, that the injury severity score, like you're already pinging on the vast majority of your patients. You know what I mean? So it's almost like you need an extended scale uh, just to, to, to match that. Um, the other day I did another podcast on osteosurgery. Um, and uh, the, the, the surgeon there was talking about, you know, we need to not only more stuff, but... Like our techniques have to be that much better so that you can then be more conservative with your gear. You know what I mean? Um, so it's, you know, obviously a multifaceted uh, approach. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So on, Actually, kind of, just kind of like yeah, to touch on that real quick, too. I mean, I, I completely agree that <clears throat> to do more effective surgery, you need to have better surgeons. That's kind of what it comes down to. And I would say the DOD has an issue right now where we are not able to retain high quality trauma surgeons like that on a scale needed for large scale combat. I mean, um, you know, everybody kind of knows that a flight surgeon isn't actually a surgeon, you know, as much as I think politicians like to believe that when you tell them, Oh, Hey, we got a flight surgeon in every bird and we got flight surgeons everywhere into a politician and a policymaker, they may think that, we got surgeons everywhere. The reality is we don't. And I think there, that needs to be made very clear to the people that are deciding where the dollars go, that we don't have the surgeons everywhere where we need them. And so, yeah, I, I completely agree that we need better and more uh, surgeons. And that may mean we need more investment, whether it's through the military medical education system, through the UCIS, you know, military med school, um, and I know, I know a lot of our audience and a lot of our team, actually, I would say a very small number of our team members are actually at the physician-surgeon level. They're mostly the medics, nurses, and whatnot. But, um, you know, and I'm not trying to plug, like, the whole surgeon folks. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we need more of those guys, too, on the, as far forward as we can get them. So that's kind of the reality. And, actually, side story on that is, uh, so back in 2016, one of our teams had trauma surgeon. Uh, we had trauma surgeons, vascular surgeon, ortho surgeon, um, in Northwest Iraq. And so we were essentially putting, uh, like a role three capability out in the field in Northwest Iraq. And there were a lot of, well, there's one major instance where uh, a lot of U S active duty casualties came to us because the nearest actual FST with surgical capabilities was about two and a half hours away. Some of these guys would have bled out if they tried to go there. And so, um, and I think some of the, the soft guys and some of the Intel guys probably are familiar with that incident back in 2016. But, um, you know, that's just a perfect example. It's like, hey, we, we were able to take a land, almost like a land or a or a Baghdad support center capability, and we put it all the way in the field. And that was the way a lot of these high-speed dudes stayed alive. So, I mean, that's we need more of that. And it's it'd be better if DOD could do it. Um, you know, right now, it's, you know, maybe groups like ours that are doing it. But, uh, but yeah, there, we just need more, more, more surgeons. Yeah, I mean, especially if you're talking uh... – 
you know, peer, peer to peer, near peer to near peer type conflicts, people are going to get chewed up. And it's incredibly sad as it is to lose just a soldier or a Marine or a medic. Like when it comes to medical capability, if you lose a surgeon, that can be catastrophic. When it comes to capabilities lost. Um, now, uh, speaking of the medics on the ground, uh, do you have any lessons learned from those guys? Yeah, so kind of looking at, um, again, looking at more, rather than specific interventions, um, as opposed to like, I don't know, using deer blood instead of human blood, like not, like, which is obvious, don't do, don't do that. But um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that we found was interesting was that the phases of war itself uh, dictated a lot of uh, differences in terms of how your medical practice was going to be applied in the field. So, but I, what I mean by that is <clears throat> when, when Ukrainians and the Ukrasov guys and the, the, you know, the special, special operations surgical teams were in defensive mode and we were slowly falling back as the Russians came forward, you know, in their meat waves, <clears throat> you got to figure out, where are you putting your surgical team? Where are you putting your medical teams? Where are you putting your casualty collection points? Now, the thing is, in defensive action, you can plan your staging points, your nodes, in the area behind you because this is area behind the front line. So I can say, hey, I've got time to plan point X, Y, Z because I know where they are and I know the routes and I can figure all that shit out ahead of time. And so planning for defensive your, you know, rearward movement with your medical teams is, is much easier um, than when the line isn't moving and it's static or you're trying to engage in offensive actions and move forward into either hostile held space or unknown space. Um, and so, again, it's like, think of it this way. You have people invading into your town. You know your town. You know where you can put stuff. You know where you can put stuff underground. And so the planning ahead of time for defensive action, fine, easy, done, whatever. And then, then when it came to, you know, static, the front line became static. All right. Uh, <clears throat> trying to evac people off the X and right on the front line is hard because that front line isn't moving. You're just getting blasted constantly. That's hard enough. And then because your line isn't necessarily moving, the Russians with their overhead watch, whether it's drones or flights, you know, as long as they had flight you know, overhead or something, they could see kind of where your rat lines were and figure it out. And so it was easier for them to kind of bombard your evac lines, your CCPs, and especially guys that are stuck on the X, like the evac times went from minutes to hours to hours to days when, when the line went from rearward movement to a static line. And so, again, you're looking at just like next level difficulty in terms of planning. So try and get, you know, your planning done well ahead of time for that. Now the, the most difficult phase is, offensive movement and movement into either hostile held space or unknown space, because, you know, again, it's hard enough to plan offensive action through hostile space or, you know, unknown space. And that's just the guys that are kicking doors and shooting things, you know, but how do you plan your logistic chain for your med support? You know, how do you plan your medevac routes when you don't have an idea of like, I don't even know what the terrain there is. It looks like it's solid earth. It could be mud, you know, um, that's just a real basic example or, I see a bunch of buildings over there. Which of those have suitable basements? Which of those have suitable garages? Um, which of these have intact roofs? And again, because if you're looking rearward, I know that building X is intact and stable. I know this one over there has a radio antenna I can stick out a window or something. You know, it's like, it's easy to plan stuff behind you. It is infinitely harder to plan things ahead of you. And so when it comes to, uh, you know, trying to plan offensive action, that was a huge issue in terms of, I think why, you know, the offensive movement didn't go anywhere near as smooth as it could have or should have uh, in Ukraine. And then also just thinking about the future. Like, I know DOD, we come up with op plans for everything. I mean, hey, we got a plan to invade Calgary if we needed to, right? So it's, uh, but, you know, we got to, it's again, thinking ahead for offensive action, and offensive movement, and how you're going to plan your med support it shouldn't be like an afterthought or a side thought in terms of, Hey, I know how to blast my way into Calgary or Beijing or wherever the heck we want to go. Uh, I'll have to think of examples, obviously, but it's like, um, 
it shouldn't like it shouldn't be a side thought or an afterthought of how are we doing the med support piece because that's it is the critical piece to any of this um and so see so yeah, i think kind of like big things uh in terms of what our guys were seeing on the front was that this planning piece was just it was easier for our counterparts to plan rearward rear, rear movement but it was way harder when it was static and for the brief time that we'd even attempted offensive operations, it, it, it was, it was a, you know, complete shit show. So um, I think trying those planning phases are, are going to be key for uh, I think lessons learned in terms of what is the real front line of medicine uh, looking like with large, uh, you know, I mean, you know, like the, the next, you know, catchphrase that everyone loves is the large scale combat operations. So like in LISCO operations, you do your do your med planning so that's i think kind of the big thing there yeah absolutely um i've been noticing a lot lately um when it comes to ukraine is about tourniquets and tourniquet conversion and i've been seeing a disturbingly large number of people saying we should remove uh the tourniquets um because they're you know everybody's legs are falling off um i guess since you're there, like, what is the actual problem? Yeah, so in, in my humble opinion, that's the dumbest idea ever. Do not remove tourniquets from the treatment algorithm. That, that would be, it's like taking oxygen out next, I guess. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, so in my experience, and not even just, I would say, Ukraine, I would say other parts of the world, <clears throat> one is, I would say, the stigma of, amputation. And that is, I think what we're seeing because a lot of people learned how to put tourniquets on. Essentially no one knows as far as frontline troops and stuff, how to, what do you do after that? And I think that is why we're seeing all these guys make it back from the front line. They're surviving, which is the, the end goal. I mean, everyone, you know, making your, making yourself, you know, survive combat is, is, is goal number one here. And I think that may be why people are, you know, they're losing sight of that or something. But, um, you know, these guys make it back from the front line and, all right, you've had a tourniquet on for three days. Sorry, we've got to take your leg off, but, you know, you're alive. So that's, I think, the stigma of uh, amputation psychologically for a lot of these people is what <clears throat> what they're hearing and seeing. And, and you know, you got to keep in mind, Ukraine is seeing, um, you know, not just ones or twos or hundreds of survivors of combat, they're seeing thousands. So you're having thousands of people come back with multiple amputations, maybe or may not be due to tourniquets, but there is a, there's a social stigma to amputation. That being said, what they're not hearing is the tens of thousands who aren't alive, you know? So, um, and I'm sure they would complain about their status uh, a little bit more than the guys that are missing some limbs. So I think, I think one is, there, there's no reason to be afraid of tourniquet use. It's, it is, it is vital to keeping people alive in combat. Um, and I think we have years and years, if not decades of evidence to prove that. So, so that's, that's, that's number one. Number two then is, yeah, we do need better training in terms of tourniquet conversion, because I know one of the things that we've had to teach a lot of our medical counterparts was exactly that a patient gets delivered to you with the tourniquet on, what do you do next? And a lot of people say, I don't know. We, Take it off, see what happens. Oh, well, okay, fine. Well, you got a pulsatile bleeder there. So, all right. So, so a lot of what we were teaching folks, kind of at that next level of care, was you know get the tourniquet off. You know, keep in mind electrolytes because everyone knows you get a kind of a blast of cytokines if, if when you uh, take that tourniquet off. Also, what do you do about the underlying vascular injury? And so we were teaching a lot of people about uh, you know uh, vascular ligation which if you know how to tie a knot, we can teach you how to do a vascular ligation. You essentially get a clamp on the vessel, tie it off, wham, bam, done. Now, <clears throat> next level, if you have an ability to potentially salvage a limb, you know, we're teaching shunts um, and then vascular reconstruction, um, which is, you know, that is next step uh, up there, and that, that would require, I would say, at least a surgeon. May, may not necessarily require a vascular surgeon or a trauma surgeon, but we can teach most surgeons how to do vascular shunts, vascular reconstructions. Um, and so that's, you know, again, those are the things to keep in mind. And I would say from a, from a, a surgical standpoint that it seems relatively straightforward. And, but I can also understand how to the layperson, to a field medic, to someone who 
it isn't operating at that level, I can see why that's an intimidating prospect to like, all right, I got to find that vessel, clamp it, tie it, or, or get a shunt in it or do a reconstruction. Completely get it why that may be intimidating to a lot of folks. But that shouldn't stop someone from putting a tourniquet on in the first place. So I think to not to not to kind of like hammer this point too much, um, absolutely keep using tourniquets. I, I, would, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, you know, it's like the, the, the paradigm of, of uh, trauma is you want to keep as much blood in you and blood in you as possible. And so, yeah, well, if we can, if we can stop it from running out all over the floor and the walls, let's, let's do that in whatever way we can or need to in the, in the interim. And we will fix the underlying injury at a later date and time as we can. Um, and, and again, if I, if I can, just say this one time too. It's like, I know that the tens of thousands of amputees and, and all, all of this, it, yeah, it is socially stigmatizing, but it is infinitely worse for the tens of thousands who aren't alive because they bled out, you know? So um, just keep that in mind when it comes to, yeah, let's keep using tourniquets. Just sure. We got to do some more training. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm not there right now, um, nor have I been. But it seems like this is a training problem. From what I understand, you know, the medics who are there on the outset, you know, you get a full pipeline, you get whatever training and experience they were getting, right, before the war. After the war, everything gets shrunk down to what is the bare minimum that I need to do to have a functional human uh, fill this role and then pump them out. So... Like how, I guess, how fast is their current pipeline? Like, is it days, weeks, months? Yeah. So kind of exactly what you mentioned. So yeah, prior to the war, a lot of uh, troops that, uh, you know, were active and especially, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the Ukrainian folks that have been active ever since 2014 were the fully, fully trained high speed guys and and gals. Um, You know, those were, those were quality folks that, um, <clears throat> were, were good at their good at their trade um they're good at the craft i mean they, they were some solid folks and so when we first um had our you know prior seals and sf guys and you know not to not to miss out on all the other folks within the soft community that, that just was kind of the the bulk of our guys um, <clears throat> um those our counterparts were very highly qualified and a lot of them had been training with you know 10th group um who had been in country for a long time as well. So we were, we basically picked up the ball when, you know, soccer kind of pulled their folks out. Um, we just essentially just backfilled them. That's basically where we picked up with a lot of these guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, as the war progressed and casualties mounted and, you know, we got tasked with essentially training a new pipeline for Ucrasoft, it was definitely a, a very abbreviated course that, um, you know, we were running them through, uh, at least one month of training, uh, essentially 24 seven training, um, for this type of stuff. But it was, it was full. It was the full spectrum of training. It wasn't just medical. So our guys were doing everything, training them on everything. Um, and so, so we did that. And, but even within that, we could really only dedicate, you know, a week, And that was trying, you know, getting up to like, you know, T tri C kind of like stuff proficiency. It wasn't really much beyond that, you know? And so that was, that was where we were training the Ucrasoft guys. Um, We did have a separate uh, stream that was training their physicians and surgeons and some of their existing uh, special operations surgical teams. But again, keep in mind, those guys already had careers in medicine. I mean, these were, these were basically taking like a U.S. like, you know, special operations surgical team and just refining them. We weren't generating new ones. Um, I think it, I think it would be practically impossible to try and take you know a group of lay people and make them a a surgical team. So so yeah, I mean right now exactly to your point, we are looking at a couple of weeks of training at best, um, and within that, um, you know, a portion of that being medical, and that's you know for the for the uh, for the frontline folks. Now that being said, there are components of folks who are being taken out of country to NATO partners and they're getting several months of training, but that's usually on weapon systems, whether it's, you know, Bradley's tanks, jets, heavy weapon systems and stuff. Um, 
But when it comes to your frontline grunt or the new uh, soft guys, you're looking at, well, I would say when it was at the most rushed, it was a couple of weeks. I would say we're getting back to a, a little, you know, over a month, month two. Um, but, but yeah, again, like the portion of that that's dedicated to medical is pretty small and it's, you know, yeah, everyone wants more training and they need more training. And it's just, there's a finite time that these guys have to get to the front. So. Yeah. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast, right? Guys are getting chewed up and you need more people to fill in and you need them faster than what you can do always because of that crunch timeline. There's stuff that needs to get cut out and my guess is that tourniquet conversion is probably one of those things that gets truncated pretty hard. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it too, it's kind of like, what's, what's the easiest to teach someone to get them to conception and understand? I think putting a tourniquet on, okay, get it. I clamp this thing down and it stops the pipe. I right, cool. Got it. But I think for them to conceptually or for anyone to kind of just conceptually pick up something that requires almost like a, even a basic medical understanding of why you're doing something and, what is what does this sign or symptom mean? Like, uh, yeah, that's that's beyond I would say most people. I mean, it's easier to teach them how to point and shoot and you know pull a pin or something. Um, and and that that I think in their calculus is that that will shape the battlefield more than a higher level of medical training for everyone. So that's just a choice that leadership makes. Yep. It's it's you know so. Yep. Yep. Um, when it comes to training, so you mentioned, you know, initially, you know, their course lengths months. Now we're shrinking it down to a couple of weeks. Um, do you have any lessons learned as far as, you know, initially this was our plan as far as what needs to get cut and what needs to stay. And now that you have, you know, um, hindsight, um, would you have adjusted fire in any way? You know, I think what we, I think what would or could be in a more effective thing would be, <clears throat> you know, you got everyone getting trained in everything. I would say there's like a, essentially it's like a blanket course. It's like everyone get this and we got, you got to go. I think it may benefit and I don't have any data or evidence to, to support this, but I think what might help is if you peeled off some of these guys and instead of really fully engaging them in how to do CQB or offensive movements and all that kind of stuff, fine, get them, get them the basics of point and shoot. But then let's spend the rest of these weeks on medical for these guys and let's make them really proficient medically and fine. If you got to keep them in the rear, keep them in the rear, fine. But let's get at least within every unit or some quantity of people, let's make one of these folks really qualified at the medical because that way you get your guys off the X they encounter someone who's medically knowledgeable right away rather than waiting till hours, days, weeks later till they get to someone that's really medically knowledgeable. Let's, let's try and push some of that knowledge forward. And so I think it would have been a benefit and still would be beneficial if you had like a separate pipeline where we pulled some folks off and you made them really good medically. Um, and again, that's, and I know people say, Oh, well then they're not going to know how to like, fly a drone. They're not going to like throw a grenade. Everyone, everyone figure out throw a grenade. It takes an afternoon to learn how to throw a grenade. You know, so um, the, I think you just get them basically proficient in what they need for the front line, but really hammer them on the medical. That would have been, I think, and, and still, again, still, still could be implemented. So, you know, if anyone of any influence is listening to this, let's, you know, explore that idea. Maybe. Right. So maybe something similar to the, um, the A, what's it? AF, ARFR type programs with a ranger advanced first responder. Like he's not a fully quite fully qualified medic, a soccer medic, but he's definitely far more high, higher speed medically than, you know, your average rifleman. You know, just take off the guys who have some uh, talent, some interest and pull them off to the side and get them even more medically trained. So, they can augment at the at the minimum their first responders, and because uh, that was one thing you know we talked about, and I've talked about with a lot of other uh, surgeons, it's that the guy has to be able to survive the surgery. Like if he's so you know under resuscitated, his airway is 
com has been compromised, his respiration has been compromised. If you can get a more stable patient to the surgery, they can get through the surgery that much faster and thus you'll be able to treat more if you just have more stable patients getting to you. Yeah. Um, so uh, another part I've been hearing about uh, the transport, right? I've, you know, everything from throw the guy on your shoulder and run to throwing them in essentially anything with wheels on it and driving them around. Um, I've also heard about things like drones and, and other ideas. So kind of, you know, what, I guess, what is ha kind of happening? And have you heard any, have you got any lessons learned from the transport aspect? Yeah. So, you know, with, with transport and logistics, um, obviously the problem is always Russian, you know, drones, bomb strikes, whatever, lancets, you name it, a priority for them is hitting the medical folks. I mean, so, and it's like down to a person. I mean, you literally, they see a clump of two guys carrying one dude. That is a higher priority target than any other personnel they see in the field right then. Um, you know, they see a medical vehicle doing an evacuation. That is now the highest priority thing, maybe other than a command vehicle. And that's it. I mean, similarly, you go up the chain, they see a CCP, they find casualties collecting anywhere, they're blowing the hell out of that thing. So, so yeah, the, the entire medical chain is a high priority target for the Russians, for any future opposition. I have, I have zero belief in the fact that any opposition we will ever face in combat as a nation is ever going to abide by the Geneva Conventions and actually respect our medical personnel. So, <clears throat> you know, assume that that Red Cross is a, just a big target. Um, and so when it comes to what do we do about that, yeah, logistics and getting people off the X or, you know, two casualty collection points is, is difficult because you're always getting targeted. And so, um, yeah, it, the, the, it was basically just get them out. And so it was just carry them, get them in any vehicle that can get through the terrain. Um, you know, they tried, you know, the M113s, they tried track vehicles for evacs. Um, and it just, the, the track vehicles were just too cumbersome. They just weren't, they were not able to handle the terrain for medevac purposes in a, I would say in any quality way that, you know, from what we were told by our, our Ukrasov counterparts. Um, so wheeled vehicles, <clears throat> especially in this terrain, are, are what you need to get by and get out. Um, and so whether it was the Humvees that were getting donated um, or any other type of APC that was wheeled, those kind of became the preferred uh, method for evac. Um, obviously, you know, we wish we could do um, airborne evac, but that isn't happening because you can't get a helicopter or anything anywhere near those front lines without getting blown out of the air. Um, so, you know, those are kind of the, all the obvious, I would say, concerns when it comes to evac and logistics. Um, the other option, and this is nothing new, this is as old as warfare, is just underground. And so it's kind of just, again, mapping your terrain. And that, again, goes back to what we had mentioned earlier, where rear area movement in terrain you are familiar with is much easier because you know where the underground rat lines are. It's a lot more difficult when you're moving forward into unknown space or hostile held space. I mean, um, you know, let's just use uh, for, you know, the, I don't, there may or may not be a way to kind of apply this, uh, but, you know, if you look at, you know, combat going on in Gaza right now, or just other parts of the Middle East where there's a, there is a massive under, underground part of these warfare, you know, there, this that three dimensional effect of warfare, where it's, there's a lot of it underground. Well, how do you, how do you map a rat line underground when it's, hostile held space that you have no idea how it's actually mapped or what, what it, the layout is, or is it all booby trapped? So again, um, while underground protects you from all these overhead, uh, you know, airstrikes, drones, et cetera, it's, it is, it's just difficult. Um, and then going to your question about, uh, you know, ground or a drone evac opportunities and capabilities, um, I would say it's definitely at the very prototype phase of any of this being in any employed in any meaningful way, let's say, um, you know, I think there's a lot of stuff you'd see on like, you know, popular science magazine about a unmanned helicopter coming in and picking up some guy off the ground and flying him off to a, you know, roll to somewhere. Um, where we're at right now is you essentially have unmanned ground vehicles that can go up to a patient essentially kind of like a, a luggage 
conveyor belt, pull them onto the vehicle, and then just drive back. But there's essentially no on route care. Um, that assumes that that unmanned ground vehicle can navigate that terrain in the first place and doesn't lose signal or reception. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there's obviously the, this whole thing is still obviously in the very prototypical phase of development. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of things that's need to that kind of be worked out. I, I think it's promising. I think, you know, we look, you know, just the evolution of uh, warfare and medicine, um, maybe 10 years down the road, we might see something that I think is, what we are kind of envisioning for a, a drone goes to pick someone up and somehow does a medical intervention on route without a person being there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, we're, we're, we're still years off from that. I think being reality on any kind of front line. So. Yeah. You need to get one of those Elon Musk rockets that'll. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe he'll invest in it. Who knows? I mean, we've got to get his yeah. investing priorities straight, but yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, we didn't go over this before, but um, do you have any like maritime? So I, I've seen a lot of like maritime videos. Uh, any kind of maritime lessons learned or anything you've heard? Yeah, so um, we have had a number of our uh, prior SEALs training their naval commandos. Um, but I think in terms of the the operational things they're learning still, Beyond things that would be relatively straightforward, I, I, I believe that those still might be considered like an OPSEC issue for them. So I wouldn't, not, I wouldn't probably dive into too much of that. But I mean, again, you have, but, but the relatively straightforward stuff is if you have an insertion somewhere into, let's say, Crimea, for example, uh, let's hope you brought all your stuff with you. Because again, that evac is a very long evac back to friendly territory. So you know, again, it, it comes down to in terms of, you know, you know, non opsec stuff. It's just like, again, make sure all your guys are very well trained because you're not going to have much to fall back on if someone's injured and you are now on a hostile held island. You know, I mean, right. So, right. The peninsula. That, uh, your evac is over ocean. So it's not going to be calm. Um, well, very cool. Um, uh, you know, GS, GSMSG, I, I can't say it fast at all. Um, you know, um, you know, if people are interested, they want to get in contact with you for whatever reason, um, how do we do that? Yeah, so um, I'd say folks uh, that we're generally recruiting for are, again, you know, prior special operations, prior intel, um, any, any MOS, um, medical obviously is a benefit because that helps uh, certain pipelines that we work on, but you know, we'll you know, 18 Bravos, Charlies, Deltas, you know, whatever. Well, obviously the Deltas, but um, you know, any MOS within the uh, special operations community is, is, has a skill set that can be used in some place where we're doing something. Um, <clears throat> so with that, and then, uh, you know, MDs, physician surgeons, you know, preferably part of DD, um, you know, any of them are, are welcome to apply and join. Um, generally, we have people apply on our website, and then it's a lot of it is word of mouth, too, at this point. I mean, a lot of people, if you know someone that's on our teams or has been on our teams, um, they know how to get in touch with kind of our, our headquarter folks or me personally, and then we'll kind of vet people through, um, you know, kind of the usual network. Obviously, we'll go through all your paperwork and stuff, but if someone tells me you're from third group as an 18 Delta, we're going to talk to all our guys in third group and say, this guy, you know, so, uh, yeah. Um, so a lot of kind of stuff like that, but, uh, but yeah, I think people that are interested, um, you know, we'll figure out to get in touch with us and, and then we'll, we'll reach back out to them. Um, I would say processing does take a couple months in terms of, uh, vetting folks, just cause as you can imagine for any, any group, it's like you get, you say, we got an opening here. We got 99 people who are, interesting maybe sane people and one of those is a qualified you know xgb guy or something so um yeah but yeah just go to our website it's uh, www.gsmsg.org if you can say it three times fast you're basically uh, automatically on the team and then um you know that's kind of it's <laughs> kind of it so well crap i'm excluded so um <laughs> but uh 
Well, awesome. Hey, Aaron, I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. And, um, you know, like I said, we've got interesting stuff going on in the future. And so when some of these things uh, develop into something more, I'll be happy to talk with you more about, about those things when they all kind of come together. Perfect, perfect. That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Our boy is waiting there for you.